stand up with us in this morning in the house of the Lord raise your hands with me we're so thankful that you are the God of the promise we worship you Jesus we thank you that you are faithful and you stick to your word no matter what so we believe and we're trusting you for good things this morning I'm not gonna wait wait for the walls to fall Cause I know a name that can bring them down And I've got a priest waking within my soul And I'm not ashamed to declare it now Come on, sing it out with me Light of the world, trample the darkness Nothing can stop it You are the God of the promise Every word will be accomplished Nothing can stop it You are the God of the promise Sing this out, prepare the way Prepare the way, the King of glory comes Before His name, every fear must bow 
Throw off your chains Jesus destroyed them all Up from the grave He is with us now Light of the world Trample the darkness Nothing can stop it You are the God of the promise Every word will be accomplished Nothing can stop it You are the God of the promise Whoa. We declare Your name Jesus He conquers all oh, The gates of hell will never stand a chance your name prevails jesus the great i am the word will fail no weapon formed against your name prevails jesus the great i am the gates of hell will never stand a chance your name prevails, Jesus the great I am. No word will fail, no weapon formed against. Your name prevails, Jesus the great I am. Oh, come on, sing it out with me, light of the world. Light of the world, trample the dark. Nothing can stop it You are the God of the promise Every word will be accomplished Nothing can stop it You are the God of the promise oh, The God of the promise Hallelujah Give him a shout of praise this morning, oh Jesus, hallelujah, 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 we believe in your promise this morning, we believe, we believe in your promise God, you are faithful, you are faithful, Sing it out. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and you put me back together. Satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me free. We're so thankful, Lord, because the God of the mouth is the God of the valley. And there's not a place, and there's not a place, your mercy and grace. Won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Come on, do you believe that this morning? Oh, there's nothing. Nothing. 
turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one. Come on, he's turning the grave. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the
and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing Amen. 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 Amen.
And so uh, let's just pray over this prayer cloth together. It's for someone who's experiencing uh, pain in their back and they need healing in their back. So let's pray over this together. Father, we just thank you so much that this pain, Father, it's not from you. It's from the enemy. And Father, we just... Uh, command this pain to go and we thank you Lord that as the anointing from the prayer that we pray comes through our hands and into this cloth as it's delivered to her father I pray that she'll be delivered from that pain that these prayers father are effective that they connect father her heart to your heart your heart is for her healing your heart is for her health and so father we thank you that that pain leaves in the name of Jesus when this cloth is applied and I thank you, Father God, that it continues to stay away, that there'll be a great testimony, Father, of what you have done for her and in her body. Thank you for it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's a good morning, isn't it? <laughs> it's a great morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. Why don't you welcome somebody? Tell them you're glad that they're here. good, isn't he? Amen. Well, I have heard from our team. They are doing all kinds of fabulous things in the heart of the Middle East, uh, things that they're going to tell testimony of when they come. I'm not sure what I can say and what I can't say. And we're on live stream, so I just said, I'm not going to say any of those things. I'm just going to let you guys tell your testimony when you come. And uh, so they're going to do that. But I'll just tell you this part. There's been amazing things. Exactly what we have prayed for is what has taken place. And so uh, God has been moving in mighty ways, mighty ways. So my husband has shared several photos with me from their trip. They are mostly of food and sunsets. <laughs> He knows my heart. <laughs> I, I definitely want to know all the things that they're eating. And uh, so he has shared food and sunsets. And then at 3.07 this morning, he started sending me flowers. So uh, pictures of flowers. When they did their hot air balloon ride. And he must have been in a field where there were lots of pretty wild flowers. Because that's what he sent me. So I thought, ah, that's really sweet. Sending me flowers to start my day a little early <laughs> no but it was good it was really good so I was texting back in the middle of the night beautiful <laughs> and they were they were so lots of great things are happening but uh, we're, we'll pray for our team again um, as they're coming to the end of their trip here right after these announcements let's go ahead and watch some video announcements for this morning Good morning, New Creation Church family. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us online and in person. Let's get started with these announcements, but I, I wanna say this first. I was just thinking about this the other day, and if there's any season that embodies James chapter one about being tossed to and fro by the wave, like waves of the sea, I would say that that's this spring season because it's warm and then it's snowing and it's kind of like inconsistent. And you wanna know who isn't inconsistent who is consistent who is consistent tell me it's god <laughs> and that's these announcements as well <laughs> so let's see what's going on this week at new creation church parents of youth students and youth students this tuesday is our banana strip it is your spring break you're looking for great things to do and this is the event for you it's only 25 dollars, and normally an unlimited ticket is around 40 dollars. huge savings and we're taking you on the bus the bus stops are on the flyer in the foyer and in the south foyer so make sure to register there's so much more room for you we are two weeks away from the easter egg hunt 
we want to say thank you to those who've been helping us prep for the big day, especially those who packed eggs, took them home, filled them with candy. I know the kids are going to be excited on the big hunt day, April 8th. And if you're looking for ways to be involved and serve, we've got more areas of opportunity for you. You can actually help the day before the Easter egg hunt with our prep day. The maintenance team will be all about this property, getting it ready for the plus thousand people that are going to be here for the Easter egg hunt. And on the actual morning of the big hunt, we're looking for volunteers to help with the parking lot team because we need some people directing traffic because there's going to be over a thousand people coming onto this property. It's nice to have a little bit of flow direction. Yes, and then after that, the maintenance team, again, that day, we're looking for strong backs that can help set things up, get it ready for all the amazing ministry that's gonna be happening to our community on that day. And one more area for you to serve in, we like to call it frosting the lawn, where we take the eggs that we've worked so hard to pack and sprinkle them across the property for the kids to pick up. If you wanna help in one, two, or three of those areas, make sure that you sign up on the Easter tile on the NCC app. And last thing about the Easter egg hunt, we wanna talk about donations because we do prize giveaways at the hunt for the kids. And you have an opportunity to donate new bikes, prize baskets, and other things. And all that can be found on the Easter tile under donations. Yes, and if you're still a little confused, don't worry about it. We actually have a personal connection of a person who's very excited about this event. It's Pastor Sean Rossler, and you can call the New Creation Church office at 970-945-5902 and get all the answers that you still need about this amazing event, which is the Easter Egg Hunt. The Easter Egg Hunt is really the big prep day for our community to come to church the next day to celebrate and revel in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. We're having two Easter services, one at 8.30 and one at 10.30 in the morning, no 6 p.m. service. Make time to spend with friends and family. We're excited to celebrate Jesus with you this Easter. Tuesday, April 5th, there's a new ladies only small group starting up at Eileen Martin's house from 11 to 12.30, and it's a book study. The book is Woman Evolve by Sarah Jakes Roberts. It's gonna be an amazing time, and ladies, it's just for you, so make sure to get on the small group tile and sign up today. As the youth leader here at New Creation Church, I'm very excited for April 29th because we're having a biblical literacy class for the youth students. Literally, faith comes by the Word of God, and we're learning how to engage with the Word of God with guest speaker Valentina Epps. It's going to be an amazing time. The cost is free. It includes lunch and a trip to the Glenwood Springs Rec Center. So you're going to want to sign up for this class today. Our deep dive class is taking place April 22nd, and this is the follow-up to the Connect class, which already took place and had great success. So if you're looking for a next step, I encourage you to sign up for the deep dive class, which again is a prerequisite for Bible school and prayer school. And if you missed out on the first Connect class, well, have no fear. There's another one on May 7th where you figure out and find out your place in the body and how to connect to the church even more. That is it for this week's announcements and happy spring break. We're going to bananas and maybe you're going bananas about all the great things God's doing in your life and that's awesome. I just want you to check on something. And what is that something? It's the prayer groups that happen here at New Creation Church this week. Just make sure they're happening during spring break and be back tonight because we're gonna have an amazing service and the power of God's gonna be present. Say something. Something. Awesome. He'll be there too. We're excited. That's funny. That makes me think of, you know, when people say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, and they, so, right? <laughs> Something, so. <laughs> well, I just want to let you know about uh, one other thing, and that's our digital connection card. And so if you have filled out a physical connection card when you came into the building, that's great. But if you're joining us online or if you're here and you haven't done that other uh, physical connection card, make sure that you do this and uh, you can text the word welcome to our number there 970-624-0999 and it'll connect you to a few questions that'll help you to learn about the church and for us to learn about you so that uh, we can really help you find your place in the church you know it's great when you find your place in the church isn't it it's a good thing to be part of a body it's a good thing to be part of a family i can tell you guys are super excited about it y'all need to do this <laughs> now <laughs> 
So text the word welcome, and that's how it gets started. And then also, we have another text uh, uh, testimony that you can, you can text the word testimony to our number there as well and share your testimony. And tonight, we're going to be talking about testimonies, the importance of a testimony. They really are uh, so powerful. We don't even realize how powerful our testimony is. Um, but God uses those, and so we are looking to collect testimonies and, uh, if, and, and hear what God is doing, not just so we can collect them, so we can know how he's moving in your life. And so uh, make sure that you text the word testimony to that number two if you have a testimony. All right, there was one other thing. Um, I think everything's on the app for the Easter egg hunt, but that's coming up real quick. And I know they need some help in those specific areas of parking and of uh, helping with the hunt, the actual hunt. And so if you have it on your heart to help, you definitely would be a great help. So um, you can get onto the app. You can also use the QR code there and uh, get yourself registered and signed up for that. All right, Alan is coming to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Thank you. If you came and are prepared to give by cash or debit or credit card, raise your hands. The ushers will get you an envelope. If you're making out a check, make it out to New Creation Church. And if you're watching online and would like to participate, you can do that now. Thank you, um, as always, for your generosity. Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. And uh, we're declaring prosperity, success, freedom from all debt, and all losses restored this year. So if, uh, if nothing less than that is an option, how do we get there? How do we get there? If that's nothing less than that is an option, how do we get there? So years ago, we started um, in our company, we started a business model called predictable success. Predictable success. And what that is is uh, um, if you constantly, consistently, I mean, consistently follow proven process, repeat, repeatable processes, the desired outcome can be predetermined. And it was, uh, the focus is on the process, not the outcome. But, uh, and then the outcome became predictable, predictable success. And from experience, we know that it works consistently, year after year, bad economy, good economy, whatever it is, consistently works. And so, if we wanted to ensure this outcome that we just talked about, prosperity, success, freedom from all that, and all losses restored this year, then we need to focus on the process. But know this, all things are possible. All things are possible to him who believes. And so, uh, um, and I believe it's the same in the kingdom of God. And in Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm gonna read this kind of fast. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the uh, eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It won't return to me unfulfilled. And it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Says his ways, his thoughts, his processes are higher than ours. So, um, uh, so if we follow his processes, he'll add his super to our natural. It'll become supernatural. I'll give you two real quick examples. First Corinthians eight and nine. It says Paul said, "Because of your cheer cheerful generosity." In verse eight, it says, "And my God, er, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work." So, um, it started with their natural. It started with their natural, right? Their cheer cheerful generosity, and then God added His grace, and the outcome became supernatural and all sufficiency in all things and always more than enough always abundance that's supernatural the second one philippians paul said to them time and again you sent aid for my necessities then he said and my god shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by christ jesus so again it started with their natural god added his grace the outcome was supernatural all of your needs met so the next couple times, I'm going to share four things. You know, there could be more, but there's the law of diminishing return. 
we can only handle three or four things. So there's only four things, four things here that we can do right now that will determine, that we can predict the outcome and, uh, in 2023. However, there's a but. If we don't believe that God is faithful to his word, chances are we won't do our natural and that will limit his supernatural. And so, first things first. Matthew 6, 33, number one, first things first. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first God's righteousness, God's kingdom and his right way of doing things, his righteousness, his right way of doing things. And we'll start at the beginning in Genesis chapter one. It says God's in verse 26, it says, I'm gonna read this fast too. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 28, then God blessed them and gave the, um, said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every other thing that moves on the earth. Verse 29, then God see it, said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which on the face of the earth, and every tree whose yields uh, seed, and to you it shall be for food. So number one, he gave them dominion over the world, over their world. God has given you dominion over your world. God has given you dominion over your world. He blessed them. So he gave them the power to prosper, to succeed and excel. Jesus paid for your blessing with his blood. He paid for your blessing with his blood. Don't discount it. Don't discount it. Don't cast us off as common. The blessing is on you. Number three, he told them, be, sex, be successful. I've given you the power. It's up to you to prosper. So I've given you the power, but you've got to prosper. You're the one that has to prosper. And then um, he said, be fruitful and increase. Number four, he gave them seed, and he said, your seed will be your provision. Your seed is your provision. And it's your power, it's your provision, it's the authority over your future. And so sow the seed you have. Sow the seed you have. He gave it to you in the first place. He gave it to us in the first place. He says he gives bread to the uh, eater and, and uh, seed to the sower. So he's given it to you. You can't give what you don't have, but you can give what you do have. Amen? And... Um, then he said, it will be your provision. It will be your provision. So that's the first thing. We'll look at the others next time. So let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to give. I thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us to prosper. You're leading us in the way that you should go. I thank you, Lord. I declare over each and every person here that they will have an overflow in everything they do. They'll have abundance. They'll have increase, more and more increase. Um, supernatural. You'll add your super to all natural. Everything we do, everything, everything you said you'd do, you will do. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and pass the buckets. things new, your blood speaks a better word, your blood, the measure of my worth, your blood, more than I deserve, your blood. It speaks a better word, it speaks a better word, and it's singing out with life, it's shouting down the lies, it echoes through the night, the precious blood of Christ speaks a better word, it speaks a better word, your blood, your blood, a robe of righteousness, your blood, my hope and my defense, your blood, forever covers me, oh 
Precious blood of Christ, and it's rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny, and it's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ, and it's rewriting my history. Yeah. It covers me with destiny. precious blood of Christ it's rewriting my history it covers me with destiny it's making all things right the precious blood of Christ and it's rewriting my history it covers me with destiny Right, 
begin with praying for our team and if at any point you need me to switch to the handheld or something I can but we'll see if they can work it out or move this whatever I need to do father we just thank you so much for our team we thank you for everything you've done lord you have done glorious things such wonderful things and we thank you for protecting them and keeping them and making those divine appointments for them and father we thank you for setting things up so that people could be ministered to and saved we thank you for it lord we thank you for all of the testimonies that they'll come home with but father we do plead the blood over their trip home and we thank you father that everything that they did while they were there oh it was so wonderful but i thank you father that even the last second on the trip home, Father, the same thing. They'll be protected and kept and being able to fellowship about the good things that you've done. And I just thank you, Father. We give you praise for what you've done on this trip because you did it, Lord. You did it. You did it. You did everything that we asked. And we just thank you for it, Father. Oh, we thank you. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Cover them and keep them. Thank you, Lord. And Father, we pray over this word this morning as we're about to receive it. Father, we just thank you so much that, it's, that it is powerful. The blood has never lost its power. It speaks a better word. It's still speaking. It rewrites our destiny. It causes us, Father, to step into the very things that you planned from the beginning. And we thank you, Father God, that it corrects and it restores and it brings to pass your will and your plan. And so, Father, I pray that our hearts would be open to hear what you have for us today how we can apply this blood, how we can plead this blood, how this blood can change our life if we'll receive it. And we thank you for it, Lord. It's still speaking. It's still speaking on our behalf. And I pray, Father, that our hearts would be open to hear it today, that our lives would be changed. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, we'll tell somebody again uh, that it's a good day and you're in the right place at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> all right well we're gonna pick up 
kind of where we left off last week with some of the same scriptures. We're going to start out in Hebrews 9, 12, so you can go ahead and go there. But the blood, that's what we're talking about, the blood. There, the power of the blood. And there is power in the blood. It's never lost its power. It will continue all through eternity to speak of what Jesus did in redeeming us and in our justification. And so when we go to Hebrews 9.12, we're going to read it out of the New King James Version, and they'll put it up on the screen for us too. It says, Not with the blood of bulls and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all. I love that, once for all. So Jesus was our representative. He took all of humanity into that place. He entered the most holy place, and he placed his blood for every single one of us. And it says, having obtained an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, we talked about that last week. We talked about how our conscience is cleansed, the shame, the guilt, all of those things that would dog us, and the enemy would be the accuser, how he could grab hold of those things and try and remind us of our past, that if he tries to do that, the, the word says the blood has cleansed our conscience. It didn't just do something on the outside. It went clear to the inside, and it, and it touched our conscience. And so if he comes as the accuser, we can come and we can say, no, no, remember the blood. If he reminds us of our past, we remind him of the blood. So the blood can actually literally cleanse our conscience. And then it goes on. And it says, and for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. And that's what we're going to talk about today. By means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So I love this. There's a theme in this verse. He says the eternal spirit... Uh, the, that blood was offered through the eternal spirit for an eternal redemption so that we could have an eternal inheritance. Do you notice a theme here? <laughs> eternal is definitely the theme. This isn't a temporary thing. There wasn't an expiration date on these things that Jesus did. No, he did it once for all, all who would ever be. You know, I learned some things about expiration dates at Our Ladies Conference. <laughs> I never really paid that much attention and don't pay that much attention to expiration dates. You know, things that I've used things in cans and boxes and whatever. If they're sealed, I think it's pretty much okay. But we had crackers at our ladies' conference that were expired. <laughs> and it was one of the nastiest, grossest, most horrifying things I've ever put in my mouth. <laughs> It was so bad. We, we took that as communion, and uh, I put it in my mouth, and I was like, oh my gosh, I hope this was only mine. But as I looked around at the faces, it wasn't only mine. It was all of ours. And Kathy Tricoli was sitting next to me, and I looked at her, and I said, what the heck was that? And she said, I don't know, but it was bad. I said, yeah, it was bad. So then at dinner that night, I was thinking about it, and I said, you know, and literally, that taste stayed in my mouth for three days. We tasted what sin tasted like in the broken body of the cracker of communion, and it stuck with us for three days, like the three days that Jesus went down and raised. I mean, it was literally the taste of sin. So... Anyway, there is no expiration date on this redemption. It's an everlasting, eternal uh, redemption. And I love that. And why is it? Because there was an everlasting covenant. God made a covenant with himself in the uh, chance that man would fall. He said, we will never let him be lost to us. 
We love him. We created him, and we will redeem him. And so the son stepped up, and he said, I will do that. And that was before there ever was a sin problem. And aren't you glad that our father took care of and brought us the answers before there was ever even a problem? I love that he had such forethought because he's an eternal thinker, right? He thinks in the realm of eternity. And then there's Colossians 2, 11, out of the Passion Translation that I want to read. And it says this. It says, through our union with him, we have experienced circumcision of heart. All of the guilt and power of sin has been cut away and is now extinct because of what Christ the Anointed One has accomplished for us. See, he did it for us. And we talked about that last week, how we have a righteousness consciousness because of what he did for us. For we've been buried with him into his death. Our baptism into death also means that we were raised with him when we believed in God's resurrection power. So when were we raised? When we believed. When we believed. And when we believed, that's when it took place that we were raised in God's resurrection power, the power that raised him from death's realm. This realm of death describes our former state, for we were held in sin's grasp, but now we've been resurrected out, resurrected out of that uh, realm of death, never to return, for we are forever alive and forgiven of all of our sins forever alive. That's the place that we live in. So we're raised with Christ, and this inheritance is something that we step into, and it's active from the time that we believe and that we receive him. So it's important that we know that. It's important that we understand that. So the enemy can't steal from us. He can't lie to us. He can't accuse us. He can't tell us we're not who we are. We can say, no, no, that's not my name anymore. That is not my name. No, nope. my name is redeemed. My name is restored. My name is blessed. My name is prospered. My name is healed. That's who I am. Why? Because of the blood. And when did that happen? When we received him and his sacrifice. So it's important that we know that. And then let's jump over to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 24, which is where we were last week. Hebrews 12, 24 says this. And uh, Hebrews is really a great, read the whole thing when you, when you are studying this week. Read the whole chapter of Hebrews 12. It talks about how we keep our eyes on him so that we can obtain the end of our faith, the promise, the prize. And then it says uh, we do that as he did. We consider him. We consider his sacrifice. And when we go through a trial, we let what he did influence us to the point where it changes how we act how we respond, how we react, um, because we can act as one who is free and who lives in peace. And I love that. And then because of this peace, we have uh, this place of living in the new covenant. So Hebrews 12, 24 says this, and to Jesus, the mediator, the go-between, the agent of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood of which speaks of mercy, a better and nobler and more gracious message than the blood of Abel, which cried out for vengeance. Now, first of all, so Abel's blood cried out for vengeance or justice. He wanted justice, and, and it was right. He should be crying out for justice, and that's when the, that blood was uh, shed. It was unjust, so justice was being called for. But it says Jesus' blood has a better message. Jesus' blood has a better, nobler, and more gracious, gracious message. The message that Jesus' blood cries is forgiveness. It cries out forgiveness. In fact, the New Living Translation says this, Jesus' blood speaks of forgiveness instead of crying for vengeance. So first of all, it's a revelation that he lets us know that blood speaks. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing in itself. But that blood speaks for something. It calls out. And Abel's blood cried for vengeance or justification, but Jesus' blood provided that, and it calls for forgiveness. I love that. The NIV says that his blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The New King James Version says that his blood speaks of better things than that of Abel. 
And then God's word translation says this, Jesus' blood that speaks a better message than Abel's. So blood has a voice, and blood cries out. And just as the blood of Abel cried out, the blood of Jesus cries out. And it cries out for redemption and forgiveness and healing and restoration. And all of those things are in the blood of Jesus. And here's the good news. When we have received that blood sacrifice, when we have received him, that blood continues to cry out on our behalf. It continues to speak. It is still speaking. So one thing I want to talk about this morning is pleading the blood. How do we plead the blood? And what is pleading the blood? Well, you could even say it this way. You could say applying the blood. You could say acknowledging the blood. Or you could say pleading the blood. You could say any one of those. But pleading the blood of Jesus, uh, because it speaks a better word, is, is what we do over our circumstances. We do over the attack of the enemy. We do that over a situation or a relationship that needs restoration. We plead the blood of Jesus because the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. That word is forgiveness. It's restoration. It's healing. It's help. So I want to read something out of the uh, book by Andrew Murray called The Blood of Jesus. He says, The shedding of his blood was the culmination of the sufferings of our Lord. The atoning efficacy of those sufferings was in that shed blood. It is there of great importance that the believer should not rest satisfied in the mere acceptance of the blessed truth that he is redeemed by the blood. See, a lot of Christians just rest in that. I'm redeemed by the blood. I'm going to heaven. They don't go beyond that to what the blood is offering them in their everyday life. And then he says this. He says, But we should press on to a fuller knowledge of what is meant by that statement and learn what the blood is intended to do in a surrendered soul. Its effects are manifold, for we read in Scripture of reconciliation through the blood, cleansing through the blood, sanctification through the blood, union with God through the blood, victory over Satan through the blood, life through the blood. These are separate blessings but are all included in one sentence, redemption by the blood. It is only when the believer understands what these blessings are and by what means they become his that we can experience the full power of redemption. So as we look at pleading the blood this morning, this is part of how we experience all of those things in the blood. He says we need to know how these blessings are ours and by what means they become ours. You know, to not just rest in the fact that I am saved, but actually let salvation affect every part of my life every day because what is salvation? It's being healed, delivered, prospered, preserved, made whole and protected in every way. So that's what salvation is. It's far more than going to heaven. Well, then we go back to another scripture in Isaiah 43, 21. And it says this out of the Amplified. It says, The people that I formed for myself, they may set forth my praise, and they shall do it. And we read this last week. He says, I, even I, am he who blots out and cancels your transgressions for my own sake. And I love that. God says, I, even I, I, the one who could hold it against you if I chose to, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions. And why does he do it? For my own sake. Because there's such a deep and wonderful and intense love that he has to restore us into his presence that he says, I'm going that extra mile. I'm doing what no one else in your life would do to restore you. And then it goes on and it says, and I will not remember your sin. Put me in remembrance. Remind me of your merits. Let us plead and argue together. Set forth your case that you may be justified, proved right. So the words plead the blood, you won't find them in the Bible. 
You won't find plead the blood, but you'll find the action of pleading the blood over and over and over again. And right here, we have a precedent to plead the blood because we ask this question when we read this. He says, put me in remembrance of your merits. Well, what are my merits? Am I going to bring my good things to the Lord? No. My only merit is the blood of Jesus. And then he says, let us plead and argue together. Set forth your case that you may be justified. What is justified? Well, it's made right. It's proved right. But we could say it this way, and we said it last week, just as if I'd never because I applied the blood. So justified means that place of being proved right. And what is our case for justification? The blood. So when he says, let us plead and argue together that you may be justified, he's talking about putting forth the blood. We plead the blood. We plead the blood. So the blood is still speaking for us, but we need to speak about the blood. We need to talk about the blood. We need to apply the blood. We need to acknowledge the blood. And when we have an awareness of the blood in our everyday life, then our life begins to be covered in all of those places with the knowledge of what he did for us so that we don't accept less than what he has provided, so that we don't accept less than reconciliation and cleansing and sanctification and union with God and victory and life redemption by the blood. So pleading the blood is a very big part of how we overcome and how we appropriate the promises, how we appropriate the victory, how we appropriate the eternal inheritance in our life. It's a very important part. It's not that plead the blood are magic words, right? Because we can look at any situation and we can say, I plead the blood. But what does that mean to you? It's not that these are the magic words. It's not like, in the name of Jesus is the magic words that make things happen. No, I plead the blood and in the name of Jesus have to be attached to what Jesus did. In the name of Jesus means that I have authority in the name because he gave it to me to put my foot and trample on serpents and scorpions in my life, that I can stand in a place that he made for me and that he gave me and the enemy can't can't uh, trespass that place. So in the name of Jesus, by the authority of Jesus, I stand, right? So when I plead the blood, I plead the blood over a situation. That means I apply the blood. I'm saying that this thing has to be restored. It has to come into the right place. It has to be justified because I understand what the blood did for me. The blood was for my reconciliation, so I'm not going to accept anything less than that. I'm going to stand in this place where I plead the blood over this situation. See, it's not that they're magic words. It's not that we think we're going to get something or gain something. In fact, these are actually weapons that we have to be trained to use. So when we plead the blood... It's a weapon, and it doesn't function out of pride or entitlement, but it functions by humility. It functions because we stand in a place where we say, it's not me, it's only you. And we put our life in him so that his life can be in us. It's a place of humility. So when we plead the blood... We connect with the sacrifice that was made for us. And we have to be skillful in our application of the blood. Because we can't plead the blood with boldness without a consciousness of who we are. It's that righteousness consciousness that we talked about last week that lets us plead the blood with boldness. And then we go back over to Roman, or Revelation 12, 11, out of the New King James. And it says this. It says, and they overcame him, talking about Satan, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. 
and they love not their lives unto death. So our testimony evidently has a part in how we access the victory that the blood provided. Our testimony is part of it. So owning what Jesus did for me in every part of my life through my very own words and my very own witness, because you know that's what a testimony is. It's my personal account. <laughs> so owning what he did for me through my very own words, through my very own witness, is part of my victory. So my walk, my talk, my day, my work, my kids, my life is affected by the blood in my testimony. So, the Bible says that Jesus became flesh and he walked among us. And you know, I was thinking about this this week as I was getting ready for this message and I thought, how wonderful. You know, the blood could have been shed by Jesus as a baby and it would have been the pure, spotless, sinless blood. But he made a point to walk among us, to identify in all points as a human, to overcome temptation, to uh, feel the feelings. You know, Jesus, when we look at him in the word, he laughed, he cried, he loved people, he walked with people, he understood where they uh, hurt, and he understood so much. And that's part of what he shed blood for. And so as he shed his blood, he shed his blood in multiple places, and every one of them was for us and for a certain part of our humanity to bring it back into a place of restoration. So Colossians 1.20, out of the Amplified, says this. It says, And God purposed that through, or by the service, the intervention of him, the Son that all things should be completely reconciled back to himself. And I love that. It says all things. That means every part of us completely reconciled and brought back to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, as through him the Father made peace by means of the blood of his cross. But then when you read it into in the um, Passion Translation, it says this. It says, And by the blood of his cross... Everything in heaven and on earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent. I love that. Back to a place of restored innocence again. Original intent, restored innocence. So it was through the blood, all the way from the Garden of Gethsemane, down the Via Dolorosa to Golgotha, that was shed for us, to redeem every part of our humanity back to its original intent and restored to innocence again. So today, I want to go through just these places where he shed blood for us and what they mean, what they mean for us. So there's seven places from the garden all the way to Golgotha, and the first one is the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22, 44 tells us this. It says, And being in agony of mind, he prayed all the more earnestly and intently, and his sweat became like great drops or clots of blood dropping down to the ground. Jesus sweat blood. But it was more than just a stressful moment for Jesus. Jesus understood what was happening. Jesus was taking the cup of wrath, And that cup of wrath was so that we could take the cup of the new covenant. Every time we take communion, we partake of that cup of the new covenant. And we say things. His body was broken for me, and we break that little piece of bread, and we take it. And then we take the cup, and we say, this is the cup of the new covenant that was the blood shed for me, and we take it. So it represented something. And Jesus was taking that cup of wrath which contained all of the sin of humanity. In the garden, it was way more than just a stressful moment for Jesus, but that's what happens. Your body can sweat blood when you're under great stress. But what he was going into was so intense, it was so powerful, he was actually looking at and taking the will of humanity that went away from God and restoring the will. He was restoring our will. 
He was making it a place for us in shedding his blood that we could now choose him again. And so Jesus wrestled in the garden with his own will, and he said, Lord, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But guess what? He overcame in the place of his will. So Jesus' blood was shed for our will so that our will could be restored, so that our will could be set on the right path. And that blood is still speaking for us, for our will. The second place is when Jesus was spit upon and hit in the face and slapped, and Isaiah tells us that his beard was pulled out. In Matthew 26, 67, it says this, Then they spat upon his face, and they struck him with their fists, and they slapped him on the face. Isaiah 50, verse 6 says, I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. In Isaiah 52, 14, it says, For many... The servant of God became an object of horror. Many were astonished at him, at his face. His whole appearance was marred more than any man's. His form became the form of that of the sons of man. Wow. Isaiah 52, 14, out of the CSB version, it says this, um, Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured he didn't even look like a man. His form did not resemble a human being. Wow. In Isaiah 53, 3, it says, Like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we did not appreciate his worth or have any esteem for him. See, when his beard was plucked out, and can you even imagine? I was looking around, you know, uh, Robert and Daniel and, and uh, Stephen, they all have beards. Can you imagine? If somebody was pulling your beard out of your face and your flesh was being ripped out with it, what that would feel like and what that would look like. But Jesus did it. And, you know, they did that as a very dishonoring thing to him. But it disfigured his identity to the point where the word says he couldn't even be identified as a human being. Jesus, when his beard was plucked out, when he was beat on his face, it was for our honor and our identity. You know, identity is a really big issue right now. It's a big thing. But Jesus died for our identity. And the blood cries out for our identity. And our identity is that we are children of God, created in the image and the likeness of God. That we are created to give him glory. That our lives are to give him glory. And Jesus died and shed blood so that that place could be restored. So that we wouldn't look at ourselves and think that we are ugly or we're not worthy or we're not accepted, or we need to find a place to be accepted outside of him. He created us so that we could be accepted in him and find our true worth in him. So he died for our identity. And then, you know, and it just makes me shake as I'm just saying these because I picture the blood being shed. There were stripes on his back. In Isaiah 53, 4, it says this, Surely he has borne our griefs, sickness, weaknesses, and distresses, and carried our sorrows and pain of punishment. Yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God as if with leprosy. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. The chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. The stripes on his back were for our healing, for the healing of our body. And again, his face was disfigured, but his body was too. He was beaten to the point where his back was laid open. He was stripped and stretched over a post, and those cat of nine tails raked across his back and tore his flesh wide open. You couldn't even tell that he had flesh because it was broken for us. His body was broken for us, completely broken for us. So when we plead the blood for our healing, we're remembering that he died for my healing. And where sickness would tear and tear apart our bodies, he says, that's not right. I already paid for that. He paid for it. And that blood is still crying out for us, still. And then there was the crown of thorns that was placed on his head. And it says that they made sport of him, saying, Hail, greetings, good health to you, long life, king of the Jews. 
but that crown was placed on his head and blood flowed from his head because he brought restoration to our mind. So every thought, every memory, everything that someone had done to us or we had done could be erased because that blood flowed from his head from, so that our minds could be restored. And that means mental illness. It means every kind of disease that would attack our mind. It means every kind of addiction. You know, addiction is rooted in shame. It's rooted in shame, and the enemy plays upon that because he plays with our mind. But that was paid for. It was paid for on the cross. Every kind of anxiety and stress, everything that would attack our mind was paid for on the cross. So when we plead the blood because there's anxiety happening, because there's things happening with our mind, then we plead the blood over that, and we say, no, it was already paid for. The blood took care of it. And then there were the nails in his hands. You know, when Adam fell, God said, now the ground will bring forth to you, but it will bring forth in toil and thorns and thistles. And when his hands were pierced and blood flowed from our hands, it was to restore our prosperity, the work of our hands, so that we could freely do things with God and for God. Our hands were not made to fight and work. Our hands were made so that we could lay hands on the sick, so that life could come through our hands, so that our hands could love and lift people. He restored that place. And then there were the nails in his feet. And the nails in his feet really have to do with the path that we walk. He restored righteousness. We walk a path of righteousness and rightness because he took nails in his feet. And that restored our honesty and our integrity. And we don't have to backslide and we don't have to look back. We can look forward and we can walk forward with him, onward and upward with him. And then lastly, there was the spear that was placed in his side. And it says, when the spear went in, that blood and water flowed. And when that blood and water flowed, it really shows us that that blood was still speaking for us. You know, blood and water, I heard one person say, they're the elements of birth. And they represent relationships. Relationships. And I think about it this way. You know, that, that spear went into his side and right where the ribs are. And, you know, that's the place where God took a rib out and he made Eve, his wife, first family. And so that spear went in and blood and water flowed, but it was to restore our relationship, the heart. It went to the heart. And those relationships so affect our heart and it affected God's heart when we were separated him from him. But now that place was restored, but not just the relationship with God, the relationship with people was restored too. The relationship with our families, the relationship with our kids, the relationship in marriages. You know, Jesus, uh, we are the body of Christ. The relationships with the body were restored. The relationships, and it's such a big thing. Jesus is coming back for a bride that's perfect, that's, that's, that's put together, <laughs> not one that's fighting and separated. And those relationships can be restored, and wherever they're not, we can plead the blood over that. So I thought it important to bring these seven places where Jesus shed his precious blood so that we could see that when we plead the blood, it covers everything. There is nothing left undone. There is nothing lacking. There is nothing wanting. In fact, if we will appropriate and apply the blood and plead our case, there isn't a day that we would have to walk without. Oh, man. So how do we plead the blood? In our last few minutes, <laughs> how do we plead the blood? How do we do that? Because is it just saying the words, I plead the blood? No. It's connecting to what Jesus did. And I'll just tell you in my own life, just recently, how I was pleading the blood. So um, I had some symptoms that were very concerning to me. And so I knew that I needed to speak the word over these symptoms. I knew that I needed to be restored. I knew that they had to go in the name of Jesus, right? 
I knew that the blood had already covered it. But in pleading the blood, I didn't just say, I plead the blood, command the devil to go. No, I began to fellowship with the blood. I began to sit with the word, and Psalm 103 was my place to go. And so Psalm 103 says this. It says, Bless, affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. You are the one who covers yourself with light as a garment. Oh, that's 104, sorry. Uh, it says, it starts the same way. Bless, affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord, O my soul. And all that is deepest within me, bless his holy name. And I just started there, and I began to fellowship with him on that word. I said, Lord, I just praise you. I just thank you so much. I thank you, Lord, that I do bless your name. You're faithful. You're wonderful. You're good. You're God to me. You're my God. You're God who heals me. And then it says, bless affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not one of all of his benefits. And I began to recall and say, all right, Lord, that's right. Oh, man, you've done it before. You healed me of this. You healed me of that. You restored this in my life. You restored relationships. You restored these things. Father, when I prayed about this, you moved on it. You did it. I thank you, Father, that I forget not one of all of your benefits. Yes, you've healed all of my diseases. I thank you, Father God. Oh, that you're so good to me. And then it says, who forgives every one of all of your iniquities who heals every one of all of your diseases. And I would begin to just fellowship with the blood, plead the blood over that symptoms that I was having. And I just would picture and say, I thank you, Lord, that that blood was shed for me. I thank you, Lord, that it starts at my head and it goes into my face and it goes into my ears and my my heart and it goes all the way down. Every symptom that I'm experiencing, Lord, I thank you that that blood covers me. I plead the blood over my body. I thank you that it's restoring right now. It's changing symptoms. It's changing things. It's, it's bringing my life back into that place, Father, where my original purpose is restored. I'm coming to that place, Father, where my healing is working from the inside to the outside. And I would, and I would just speak and fellowship with the blood. And he says this, who redeems your life from the pit and corruption, who beautifies, dignifies, crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. And I would just bask in his love. I would just, I would just let myself feel his presence and his love and fellowship with him and with the word. And see, we do this, and this is how we plead the blood. If we're having a relationship problem, we bring that to the Lord, and we say, I thank you, Lord, that this isn't the way it's supposed to be. And, Father, I plead the blood over this relationship. I plead the blood, Father God. And we begin to picture the blood flowing into every part of that, healing every crack in our heart, healing every word that was said, healing everything that was not right and bringing it into restoration. We begin to see ourselves speaking to and fellowshipping and doing things with that person because the blood has restored. See, we fellowship with the blood. We fellowship with God's word. We do that, and we speak it, and we don't just do it once, and we don't just do it twice. We do it over and over and over again until the thing looks like the blood has changed it. (laughs) See, with those symptoms that I was experiencing in, in my body, I didn't just do it once. I didn't just do it twice. In fact, there was nights I was just laying in bed awake for hours, and hundreds of times I would repeat and fellowship with these words with him laying there talking to him receiving what the blood had done for me that's how we plead the blood so we don't just say I plead the blood and walk away (laughs) no that's trying to make it magic words (laughs) but it's not It's knowing him. And Andrew Murray said this. He said, it's the constant speaking of that blood that keeps heaven open for sinners and sends streams of blessing down to earth. It's through that blood that Jesus as mediator carries on without ceasing his mediatorial work. The throne of grace owes its existence ever and always to the power of the blood. Oh, the wonderful power of the blood of Christ, just as it has broken open the gates of the grave and of hell to let Jesus out and us with him, 
so it has opened the gates of heaven for him and us with him to enter the blood has an almighty power over the kingdom of darkness and hell beneath you know when you plead the blood you can sing it you can say it you can declare it or you can pray it <laughs> and you know sometimes when I was pleading the blood I was just saying oh the blood of Jesus singing which I don't know if I should sing it for you because my singing is not like the worship team <laughs> oh the blood of Jesus it washes white as snow it heals my body and and just singing those things over myself and you know you can do that anywhere nobody even has to know what you're doing but you sing over yourself or you say or you declare or you uh, pray however you release and connect with the blood we need to be connecting with the blood so pleading the blood why do we do it because it's a weapon because the blood is still speaking on our behalf and if we connect to the blood then I love how he says it here streams of heaven rain down blessing upon the earth <laughs> amen well, why don't you stand with me the power of the blood this has been such an awesome series such a powerful series and I really pray that we are putting to practice the things because you know our lives will be so changed they'll just not be recognizable they'll not be the same if we are pleading the blood over every part of our life our relationships our job our work see God God shed or Jesus shed blood for all of those things our healing our mind all of those things amen well if this is the first time that maybe uh, you're really acknowledging the blood and uh, you're re recognizing and realizing that you need that blood to be a part of your life and that maybe you need to start with being born again, then this is your opportunity this morning. I always like for us to pray and give us uh, that place to dedicate our heart when we hear the word like this. And so um, let's just pray together. For those who are online, for those who are here in the room, uh, if you pray this prayer, make sure you come up to the front and tell our altar care team. Make sure that you let them know that you prayed this prayer today and that this was maybe the first or maybe this is a rededication for you. They have things that will help you to grow and continue in that decision that you made. If you're praying this prayer online, make sure that you... Uh, share your story on our app there and let us know that you prayed this prayer we want to send you the same materials that we give uh, to the people who are up front we'll just send them in a digital form and uh, it's powerful it's powerful the blood is still speaking so pray this with me father I thank you for the blood this morning I recognize and realize that it was shed for me and I desire that reconciliation I received the blood this morning I received the sacrifice Jesus be my Lord today I receive you in Jesus name Amen it's a great decision it's a simple prayer but it's a life-changing decision. Amen? Well, Pastor Mark and our team are going to be coming home this week. Make sure you continue to pray for them. Keep them in your thoughts. And uh, boy, I can't wait till next week. Uh, we are going to receive new members next week. I think we have a baby dedication next week. And we're going to have testimonies, I'm sure, from our team next week. But in the meantime, come back tonight. We're going to talk about the power of a testimony, and it'll be great. Amen? Amen. Say this as we go. What God did in Christ Jesus, what God did in Christ Jesus far, exceeds far exceeds any damage done to me by Adam's fall. Amen.